I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler, I am your host, and this is the 82nd edition of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing improvement of your own brain by any and all means at your disposal. As I believe I hinted at last week, this is going to be our first ever fungal edition. We're actually dealing not with a pharmaceutical, not with a plant, not with an interesting practice that you might do like meditation or physical exercise, but with a fungus. The fungus called lion's mane mushroom. It's actually called several different things, and it's got a scientific name, which our guest will be kind enough to pronounce accurately for us. I'm not even going to try. But if you come across it, you'll probably hear it called lion's mane. It looks a little bit like a bushy lion's mane. Also, it just looks kind of like a big beige blob, but lion's mane makes a much cooler name. We're going to be speaking with Eric Saracidis, who is a mycologist, one who studies fungus. He actually runs a business called mycoformulas.com and is in my neck of the woods. I'm from Oregon originally, and he's in Southern Oregon. And he was recommended to me recently, very enthusiastically, by a friend who saw him speak at an event locally and rang me up and said, hey, Jesse, you've got to get this guy on your show. He's talking about this fungus. It's got these cognitive enhancing properties. And like so many of the things that we have not yet covered in our 81 and counting episodes, I'd heard of Lion's Mane, but yeah, we hadn't gotten around to doing an episode on it. I've never tried this stuff myself, but we called him up, got him to come on, and that is what you'll be hearing in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode in the ruthless listener retention gimmick, I'm going to tell you about a big fat lie that got spread around as a scientific truth for a while. This was basically a hoax that was pulled on the science news reporting community, but you might have heard about it like in real articles or press coverage and not heard the retraction. It's a pretty interesting story, so hang around for that at the end. But as usual, let's start things off with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So scientists and researchers in Australia are on the trail of a killer, a killer called motor neuron disease, which is a not particularly well understood disease in which neurons degenerate and die. From the time that a patient is diagnosed with motor neuron disease, they typically have about two and a half years to live. It's pretty much a death sentence at this point. And what's scary is, at least in Australia where this article is from and this research is going on, its prevalence is growing quite a bit. It's currently killing about one out of every 180 Australians that die, die from this disease. But that's about two and a half times the level that it was at 25 years ago. Researchers say that this is not just a case of it being diagnosed more frequently, that there definitely seems to be some sort of unknown environmental factor at play, and that's one of the things that they're trying to tease apart. Now, what's interesting, what caught my eye about this, is the method that they're using to do the research, which is a really interesting combination of genetic manipulations into a fish called a zebrafish, which comes originally from India, and has about a five-day period at the beginning of its life where it is see-through. You can see right through the thing before it becomes opaque. They also breed really fast, which for an animal that's going to be used in research where it's going to die horribly and you want a a large turnover is a good thing. Two breeding zebrafish can produce about 300 eggs in a day. So first of all, they took this zebrafish and they gave it some genes from a jellyfish that made many of its proteins fluorescent. So they've got green, blue, red, orange insides labeling specific tissue types. They can see what's a nerve, what's a muscle, what's going to be the spine, brain, heart, etc. And importantly for this study, when motor neurons die, they glow yellow. So then the next genetic ingredient is actually the human gene for motor neuron disease. So these poor little fish are going to be dying horribly over the course of the next couple of days, but they're giving kind of a technicolor example of the progression of this disease as it eats away at these nerves until they're non-functional and ultimately dead. And this just seemed like such an interesting combination of transgenics and using a conveniently transparent animal, almost like a living slide, that I just thought it was cool. And it's also an interesting microcosm of that question of can good human technology beat or outweigh bad human technologies if it turns out that the environmental factor that's causing the rise of motor neuron disease is something that's from human pollution or a contaminant or something like that. It might not be, but on the other hand, it might not be a wildly speculative guess to think that it might be. Can the attention of research scientists and this application of heavy technology outdo, outweigh some of the unfortunate byproducts of our other technologies? We shall see. Happy to report that we picked up another five-star review this week on iTunes from listener Kratom Saves, who had a pretty long-winded review. It did a little bit of a rant against some of the opinions of our guest on the addiction episode, but nevertheless, it was his favorite podcast overall and to keep up the good work, which I certainly shall endeavor to do. 
probably a good healthy thing to have some conflicting opinions among the guests, listeners, general community on some of the topics we're covering. If we weren't having some diversity of opinion, we probably would be a pretty boring show. Somebody told me once that if you ever publish anything and you expect it to go beyond hanging under your mom's refrigerator magnet, you need to expect some controversy. You need to expect not everybody to like what you're doing. And I actually one up to them because me and my sister both had things under our mom's refrigerator magnets. And I think my sister had some pretty harsh criticisms of my work even back then. So some bumps and bruises and hurt feelings and occasional objections are all just kind of par for the course. But huge thanks for the review, and also to everybody that emailed in last week. I mentioned after the sleep episode we did last week with Kirk Parsley that I'm kind of interested in doing a massive catch-up on sleep attempt, pay off the sleep debt for a couple of weeks, and see what that does cognitively. I threw that out to the listeners. I only heard back from a couple of people, so I think that one is a no-fly. There didn't seem to be a resounding chorus of interested folks on that one, which Rhiannon and I actually thought was really interesting, that there were more people that were me, me, me about starving themselves for a week when we did the water fast week than there were about people being interested in sleeping It just really goes to show the uh, schizophrenia that we all have with sleep. We all want more of it, but none of us have time for it, myself included, although I have been trying to be a little bit better since last week's episode. In other upcoming news, we're going to be doing another Twitter chat this coming Saturday. This is at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, 9 a.m. if you're on the West Coast. We're talking with Dr. Michael Lewis, two-time Smart Drug Smarts alumnus and our go-to expert on omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, krill oil, flaxseed oil, all that stuff. He's going to be there for live questioning on Twitter. If you're not quite sure how Twitter chats work, head on over to smartdrugsmarts.com slash axonchat for a really, really super simple explanation. And then basically you're just going to join us on Twitter, be looking for the hashtag axonchat, and it'll be super easy to follow along. And we'll also have a link on the website, so you can't miss it. Dr. Lewis, you'll remember, is the guy that the U.S. military has gone to for advice when they want to know how to properly treat things like traumatic brain injury with omega-3s and how that might be done. So being able to ask him questions in real time is a pretty cool thing. To stay up to date on really cool things like that, by the way, if you haven't done so yet, please do sign up for our mailing list at smartdrugsmarts.com. We'll be dropping you emails with reminders about the stuff we've got going on at Neuroscience News and updates that may or may not actually make it onto the podcast itself. If you go to the website, signing up is ridiculously easy. You can't miss it. And if you don't go to the website, but you happen to be on a mobile phone and you want to text SDS for Smart Drug Smarts to the number 33733, If you're in the U.S., that'll work. That'll give you a way of signing up from your mobile phone without needing to actually hit the website at all. I'll give you one little teaser, something I published on the website this week, an opinion piece about cognitive enhancement and why it is not that bad of a thing. There was an article I saw online recently that I took some exception to. It was published in Georgia State University magazine called The New Normal and actually featuring a lot of the thinking and ideas of another Smart Drug Smarts alumnus, Nicole Vincent, with whom I had to respectfully disagree about what the future of cognitive enhancement means for society. So if you want to hear me a little bit more opinionated than I generally let myself get on the podcast, check out that article. We'll put a link to it on the website. But now let's jump over into our main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, so as mentioned, our guest this week is Eric Saracitas of Mycoformulas. Eric is a mycologist, and, and there actually are such people. There are mycologists. And I guess let, let's talk about that a little bit first about fungus. Fungus is one of the five primary kingdoms of life here on Earth. Viruses don't count. Biologists don't consider viruses to be alive. But of the things they do consider to be alive, they break them into five major kingdoms. Monera, which is better known as bacteria, fungus, plants, animals, and then something called protists. But plants and animals kind of get all the glory. You hear about bacteria a fair amount because of everything from antibacterial soap to the helpful bacteria that live in our gut. But fungus, we kind of have this negative view of. It grows on our toenails or stains our shower curtains, things like that. And what mycologists say is, no, no, no. Actually, fungus has all sorts of beneficial uses. But unfortunately, whoever's doing PR for the fungal kingdom just really hasn't done a very good job. Because in the popular imagination, at least in the West, we really only tend to think of negative images like rotten mold and decay and streaks on my shower curtain, but that lack of maybe public awareness or public acceptance of some of the potential benefits of things in the fungal kingdom have led to kind of missing the boat on a lot of things that fungus might be able to do for us. There's really interesting study going on now in the uses of fungal-derived compounds from everything from medicinal purposes to literally building materials, believe it or not. Eric Saracitas and I are going to have a pretty wide-ranging conversation. You'll hear me a couple times probably try to kind of steer him back on the tracks to talk specifically about lion's mane because we start going off onto things like general ecology and mushrooms in general, and that's not to fault Eric at all. It's I think it just goes to show his wealth of enthusiasm for the untapped potential resource that we have in the fungal kingdom. So with no further ado, Eric Saracitas and Lion's Mane Mushrooms. 
Thanks for having me today, Jesse. Experience that I gained in my early 20s in the world of mushrooms was pretty profound and kind of showed me my life's path. I was in the United States Air Force as a teenager, early 20-something. I had a close family friend that was stricken with Alzheimer's who degenerated very quickly. His name was Dick. And within two years of his diagnosis, Dick was unable to get himself dressed or have a coherent conversation. My brother, who is a tissue culture specialist and mushroom researcher, had been doing some research on a mushroom out of Japan called lion's mane or Herisium arenaceus. And in a clinical study, they demonstrated that the lion's mane mushroom was able to improve the functional independence measure of every patient in the study. Not all of them had total reversals, but every one of them did have an improvement in their functional independence day to day. That's pretty good in every single person in the study. That's unusual. Yeah. So Dick was taking the lion's mane therapy for somewhere between three and four months. And he got out of bed one day and he got himself dressed and he took himself to the bathroom in the first time in over a year. At that point, I had just been discharged from the Air Force, uh, honorably discharged and was in a kind of a transitionary period. And what we saw from that point forward was nothing short of miraculous. Coherent conversation new memories. He was able toward the end of his life to drive again. And what we saw is him actually taking care of his wife instead of her taking care of him. And that was it. I knew what I was supposed to do with my life. And I moved into Oregon out of LA and started a mushroom company. And initially, we were a nonprofit education and research organization that hosted uh, educational seminars, hikes and cultivation workshops for the general public just to increase general you know, understanding and knowledge of mushrooms. And I had initially put myself in a position of just kind of doing the administrative functions of the organization. And about a year and a half, two years in, I was at a mushroom cultivation seminar that I had organized. And the mycologist that we booked didn't show. He, he flaked. And I had 30 people there that were all eager to learn how to grow mushrooms at home. And I didn't want to disappoint them. So I just got in front of the class and I taught the class. And we all learned a ton. And everybody went home with this bag of oyster mushroom spawn that fruited gourmet organic mushrooms on their kitchen counter. And I kind of found a, my new passion for teaching and went back to school to learn how to teach this intelligently. For people that aren't particularly green thumbs, but kind of want the comparison between how difficult it is to grow mushrooms versus how difficult it is to say, grow a rose bush in your garden or grow a tomato vine or something like that. Is it about the same skill level? Some would argue that it's even lower skill level for some of the basic cultivation techniques that we use for mushrooms. One of the things about mushroom cultivation that are really great for a hands-on experience at home is that there's kind of an immediate gratification. The mushroom spawn bags, for example, that I send home with people are fruiting gourmet mushrooms on their kitchen counter two to three weeks after they take them home. And their only instruction is to, hey, don't let this get too cold. Don't let this cook. Just leave it on your kitchen counter and do nothing. And voila, you know, three weeks later, they've got gourmet mushrooms. My kind of plant, or I guess it's not a plant. <laughs> That's actually a great discussion. A common misconception, probably. It's an important one because people have grouped mushrooms into the food group of vegetables for as long as I can remember, as far as looking at the food pyramid and, and things like that in school. But the truth is that mushrooms are very different than plants. On the ground, we look at plants breathing in carbon dioxide and breathing out oxygen, where mushrooms are breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. Plants have their own sets of diseases. Very difficult for a plant pathogen to jump over to a mammal, whereas mushrooms are afflicted by many of the same diseases, bacterial, viral, and fungal pathogens that we are. In nature, mushrooms are producing really high concentrations of antifungal, antibacterial, and antiviral compound. And when we eat those mushrooms, we're protecting our bodies, not just against one virus or one bacteria, but whole families of virus, whole families of bacteria. Mushrooms are also kind of the forgotten food group in America today. For the last hundred years or so, they've kind of been excluded from the American diet. And as a result, I think we're seeing a lot of the systemic health issues, including autoimmune disorders, on the rise. Mushrooms are some of the most amazing fuel for our immune function that's available in the kingdom of nature. Is there reason to think that historically people in the West or, or elsewhere in the world have eaten more mushrooms and funguses than they do now? That's a great question. I am unsure as to what the motives of Western settlers were in excluding mushrooms from their diet. 
given the fact that they're so rich in protein and so good for our immunological function, it's hard to imagine why they would be. But believe it or not, you know, America today is only privy to two or three different varieties of mushrooms. The portobello, the crimini, and the white button mushroom are actually all the same species, just harvested at different stages of the life cycle. Given the fact that there's over 2,000 mushrooms that are edible or medicinal in nature, and we only eat two or three of them, we're really missing out on a wide variety of compounds that support virtually every vital function of our bodies. One of the fun pieces of discovery that happened to me after I moved to Oregon out of the big city in Los Angeles was that that lion's mane mushroom that was being tested for Alzheimer's in Japan grows right here in the United States and is literally in my backyard right now. It's a fun one to, to consider the fact that there is so much food and medicine in nature that we're unaware of, and much of it is here in our own forests. Just like fruits or vegetables, there are so many different benefits to be had by the fungal kingdom that we're kind of missing. And when people think about exotic mushrooms, typically, I don't know if it's from children's fairy tales or what, but poison mushrooms are one of the first things that comes to mind. And then, of course, psychedelic mushrooms are maybe the second thing that comes to mind when you're thinking of something other than the standard mushrooms that you see in your salad in America. Is it more common for something in the fungus kingdom to be poisonous to humans than it is, say, for something in the plant kingdom? When I tell people I work with mushrooms or I work with medicinal mushrooms, one of the first questions is, is of course, oh, you mean psychedelics? So <laughs> are you sure they're not poisonous? And the truth is, with regard to poison, there are poisonous plants and there are even poisonous animals that we should never eat. In the same way, there are poisonous mushrooms, but the vast majority of mushrooms don't fall into that category. Having somebody that's knowledgeable in what is food and what isn't when it comes to mushrooms is important, but I, I think that a lot of the hype around poison mushrooms is just that. And as I said, there's probably as many poisonous plants, as many poisonous animals as there are poisonous mushrooms, but we don't worry about that every time we put a salad in our mouth. So let's talk for a little bit about lion's mane mushroom in particular. Can you tell us some about the studies that have taken place into the cognitive effects around lion's mane? Absolutely. So lion's mane is a miracle in regard to neurological research. The study of not just Alzheimer's, but many neurological diseases is linked back to a lack of a protein in our brain called nerve growth factor. And nerve growth factor is this compound in our brain that has the ability to act as the building blocks of new neurological tissue, synaptic pathways, gray matter. And the scientific community understands this very clearly. So modern researchers have developed synthetic forms of nerve growth factor for the treatment of neurological diseases. However, most of us know that most of those treatments are very short-lived or totally ineffective altogether. And the reason is that synthetic nerve growth factor is too large. The molecule is too large to pass through the protective sheath we have over our brain called the blood-brain barrier. Lion's mane mushroom contains two low-weight compounds called heresinones and arenacines that are able to safely pass through the blood-brain barrier and once inside the brain, activate the production of nerve growth factor from within the brain itself. So what we're seeing is not just an improvement in the lives of people with memory loss, but improvement for people that are, are dealing with Parkinson's, fine motor dysfunction, dementia. And it's kind of one of those missing nutrients that are really important in our day-to-day -day diet that has been missing for a long time. So I love the idea of looking at it, this from a research perspective and developing pharmaceutical grade supplements is something that I've specialized in for almost a decade now. But the truth is, if people were able to integrate mushrooms into their diet as a functional food, then we maybe wouldn't have the need for all of those supplements and capsules and so on and so forth. I was looking at one of the studies that was done. I think this was in 2009. It was a Japanese study, and it was showing some significant cognitive benefits for a group that had been taking, I guess, a mushroom-based powder based on lion's mane three times a day for 16 weeks. And they did see significant improvement, but that improvement dropped away after about four weeks after they stopped taking taking the supplement. So it, it did seem like something that needed some sort of upkeep in the system. So really thinking it more as a food or an ongoing supplementation versus a one-time fix seemed like the better modality. Yeah, it's kind of the forgotten food group. And I think it's really important for people to look at it that way. I know so many of us are kind of looking for that magic bullet to health and to the illnesses that we're dealing with. And the truth is that companies will come out and market products that claim to be just that, you know, the goji berry, the mangosteen. These are wonderful agents for supporting health and well-being. But the truth is 
a healthy human body is going to be made up of a wide variety of fruits and vegetables and in the same way a wide variety of mushrooms on an ongoing basis is crucial to support the vital functions of our body. I also read that there was accelerated wound healing, just sort of general physical wounds from lion's mane. That It seems like it's a really strong regenerative. It is. And besides lion's mane, there are many mushrooms that are very supportive of healing of the body, both internally and externally. A Dr. Andrew Wheel uh, recently released a topical product line for healthy skin based on shiitake extracts. I even have a close family member that suffered with mastitis, which is an infection of the breast that women get while their children are in their infancy. And conventional treatment is antibiotic therapy. However, she was able to uh, clear the infection utilizing mushrooms uh, as a compress And one of the bonuses there was besides clearing the infection, she was able to continue breastfeeding through this time. And if she would have gone the conventional route with the antibiotics, she would have had to stop breastfeeding. So definitely uh, several benefits to mushrooms on a topical application as well as internally. And I also have read that there have been some mood and anti-anxiety benefits, particularly for lion's mane. Yeah, it's neat. There are several mushrooms that are demonstrating anti-anxiety or calming effects for the people that use them. I would say that the research there is still fairly sparse. And I'm really excited to see as we get into various production and testing models, you know, which mushrooms and which parts of those mushrooms are providing that effect. You know, on the physiological level, people are really suffering with emotional health as well. So anything that we can find in the mushroom or plant kingdom that can help support these folks is something that we're very interested in. We've talked on some other episodes about different adaptogen plants that have cognitive benefits. And one of the common threads there is for any living organism, there are so many different potential active compounds. Oftentimes, the science hasn't yet really threaded apart what's doing what. We see sort of these grand level effects when humans ingest these things, but it's not always clear exactly what the mechanism of action is. For lion's mane, is there much of a sense what some of the mechanisms of action going on within the human body are? Absolutely, yeah. There's a class of compounds found in lion's mane and other mushrooms called beta-1316 glucan. And beta-glucans are immunomodulators. They actually, as you said, provide that adaptogenic effect where if the immune system is overacting on itself as it would with somebody that's dealing with rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis, it will downregulate aspects of the immune function. And also if the, the patient is dealing with an immune deficiency like the common cold or even a cancer, it will stimulate those aspects of the immune system. Uh, it's a very intelligent mechanism by which the mushroom compound is following the path of inflammation essentially and helping to bring balance to the immunological response. It seems like evolution has selected fungus to give us a lot of incentives to eat it, but that's not necessarily in the fungus's interest, or is it? You know, I'm a big fan of the whole concept of the circle of life, or as mycologist Paul Stamets refers to it, this large web of interconnectivity or obligate symbiosis that we're all participating in. Just the most basic level, sure. In nature, a mammal eats a mushroom and carries its spore to a different location, poops that out, and the mushroom is able to propagate itself through those means. Similarly to bird with seed, there's some bigger picture ways to look at these relationships of mushrooms and plants and animals that are really magnificent. There's four different types of mushrooms found in nature. The first are called mycorrhizal mushrooms, which attach to the roots and trees of plants and they extend the plant's ability to absorb water and nutrient at the greatest rate possible and increases its resistance to disease as a result as well. There are parasitic mushrooms that are killing living organs organisms and are easy to make into the bad guys. But the truth is every beautiful, old growth, healthy forest has these mushrooms in them. And when we take a step back, they're really facultative. They're helping to basically kill the weaker members of a species and facilitate the natural selection process, allowing the strongest to survive and procreate. Then we've got saprophytic mushrooms that are these grand recyclers of the terrestrial landscape, taking dead and dying material and recycling it back into nutrient-rich soil. And then there's the most newly discovered form of mushroom, endophytes. And endophytic mushrooms are amazing. They're actually living inside of the trees and plants of the planet, surrounding the cell wall of those plants. Initially, when they were discovered, scientists thought, boy, these are probably asymptomatic. They're just sitting around waiting for the plant to die, and then maybe they'll assist in the decomposition 
acquisition process. But what was discovered is that these mushrooms are acting as the adaptive immune system of the plant world. So when you have an insect, let's say a housefly is a perfect example, because a housefly is born and dead in, in a day or two. And as a result, its defense mechanisms are rapidly evolving. Their evolutionary process is happening in fast forward. So if we look at that on the flip side with, with insects' relationships to trees, if a tree had a stagnant chemical defense, it would be no match for the rapidly evolving offenses of the insect communities around it. There should be no such thing as a 100-year-old tree or a 300-year-old tree. Or here in southwest Oregon, northern California, we have trees that are in the redwoods that are over 2,000 years old. What's happening there is that these endophytic fungi are developing new chemical defenses against the rapidly evolving offenses of the insect communities. So when we look at a beautiful forest, what we're really seeing is this amazing race between fungi and insects to support the healthiest plant life and thus the healthiest animal life. It's that whole chain, like we said, that obligate symbiosis that we're all participating in. And really mushrooms are the backbone of land-based organisms on the planet. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of how it's theorized that mitochondria that live inside animal cells were originally kind of their own living thing and, and eventually became so symbiotic with animal cells that they just became an organelle. It, it sounds almost as if this type of fungus is sort of doing something similar with plants. It's a slow symbiosis almost towards becoming a single creature. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the Gaia theory. I have a friend and mentor who passed away last year. His name is Steve Weirman, and uh, Steve is a biologist and a brilliant scientist in his philosophy was not just his scientific understanding, but a spiritual belief. And that is that there is only one organism and that is DNA. And DNA has gone from the most simple organism floating out there in the ocean and diversified and complexified in all of these amazing ways. And we can say, oh, well, we're destined to be here. But really what, what nature has done is it's diversified itself in order to give itself the ability to be resilient. It's given our, itself the ability to withstand a super volcano or a meteorite impact or things like that. Every form of life on the planet is simply an expression of DNA. All of us have the exact same building blocks that make us a living organism. And without them, there is no life. The vast majority of the studies and the interest in lion's mane mushroom seeming to come out of Japan. Why is it disproportionately a Asian and Japanese in particular area of interest and study? We have a pretty significant challenge in, in the West with the way that clinical research is funded and the way in which we allow for the induction of new drugs. Up until very recently, there were virtually no drugs in the United States or in Europe that were not not chemically synthesized. And there are many compounds found in nature that don't work as well when they are synthesized than they do in their natural form. There's a great example of a drug called PSK that's been for the last 30 years, one of the leading cancer drugs on the planet derived from a mushroom called turkey tail. And PSK not only helps to shrink tumors, but when taken in conjunction with chemo and radiation therapy, actually ameliorates the side effects. So these patients are not losing their hair. They're not vomiting. They're not having sleep loss. It's a miracle for these patients to have access to it. But for whatever reason, Americans have not had the ability to access this medicine. Not until just the last couple of years did the FDA give an okay for funding the clinical data. It was just became so overwhelming from the patients across the country, read this information coming out of Asia and coming out of different parts of the world. And finally, it was just enough was enough. Bastyr University in Washington published a study that demonstrated that this mushroom was shrinking breast cancer tumors and helping to ameliorate these toxic side effects of the conventional treatments. And then the FDA after that said, okay, fine, we're going to put the money in to actually determine whether this is a valid drug. The PSK compound, the molecule was discovered in turkey tail in the late 1960s. So it's taken a long time for us in conventional or Western medicine to adopt the possibility that natural medicine can actually have a place in our pharmacopoeia. I mean, I guess the profit incentive for things that are owned by everybody by virtue of being naturally occurring life forms is just not there the way it is with synthesized chemicals, unfortunately. Yeah, that's an interesting point. There was this great study that came out around this mushroom called oyster mushroom or Pleurotus austriatus. It's one of the easiest mushrooms to cultivate. So in my beginner's cultivation classes, it's 
one we always use. And it's also very delicious and nutritious, over 20% protein concentration in the fruit body. Oyster mushroom contains a naturally occurring form of lovastatin. And the statin drugs are known to lower LDL cholesterol. I think somewhere close to 60% of the patients that take lovastatin in the United States suffer from mild to severe side effects. So there's this naturally occurring compound in the oyster mushroom that's discovered after the patent and distribution of lovastatin as a drug. Turns out the oyster mushroom is producing a naturally occurring form of lovastatin. Well, the pharmaceutical company that owned that patent sued to own the rights to the lovastatin in the oyster mushroom since their patent was filed before the discovery of this compound. And after a long drawn out court battle, it was determined that the oyster mushroom could keep its lovastatin and that we can eat that mushroom and enjoy the effects of lowering LDL cholesterol safely and without toxicity or side effects. The question that's probably on a lot of people's mind listening to this, how much, how frequently should people be trying to work lion's mane into their diet? If they're taking it as a pill-based supplement, what's a reasonable dosage for people? That's a great question and it's really depending on who you're sourcing it from. Not all mushroom products or supplements are created equal. There's a huge variety of options when it comes to cultivation and processing techniques that folks should be aware of. And I'll touch on maybe just the top two or three most common ones that we see in the industry and provide my opinion. The first type that's most common in a natural product store are going to be what we call ricillium-based products. So what they do is they grow the mushroom on brown rice or some type of grain substrate until the substrate appears to the naked eye to be colonized. And at that point, the lab techs pull the mushrooms out of their grow containers. They pulverize, dry, grind them up, and then put them into a capsule. The problem with this type of process is that industry average 60 to 80% of that final product is brown rice and not mushroom medicine. In the case that the company used, let's say, rye berries or something like that, the patient could actually be inadvertently taking in gluten and thinking that they're having an autoimmune response to this mushroom product when they're actually having the response against the gluten that they don't even realize they're taking. So those things are really important to look out for and they're very common in the industry. The other type are what are considered hot water extracted mushrooms. And the traditional form of Chinese medicine, so for almost 3,000 years, the Chinese took mushrooms, many of which were not edible. They're very woody, growing off the sides of trees, and they would make teas out of them. And that would release some of the water-soluble beta-glucans, some of those water-soluble compounds that tonify their bodies. And there's modern applications of that same thing today where they'll take a tea and they'll spray dry it take that residue, cut it with cornstarch, and put that into a capsule. And that's one way to ensure that you're getting a standardized product that has a specific level of potency. The challenge there is you're only getting one aspect or a a very narrow band of the beneficial attributes that mushrooms are producing. My company, Michael Formulas, produces a product that is full spectrum. And what that means is that we take the mushroom through each stage of the life cycle, the mycelium, the primordia, the fruit body, and spore, all of which have medicines that don't occur in those other stages of the cycle. And we combine them together so that we get a product that's both full spectrum, offers all of the beneficial compounds, not just the immune enhancing compounds, but simple things like the proteins, the vitamins, minerals, essential amino acids that mushrooms are producing during their life, and then combine them. In our production facilities, we go a little step further and actually mimic the native habitat of each of these species. For example, the cordyceps mushroom that comes from the Tibetan plateau in our grow environment we are changing the gas exchange, the temperature, the humidity to mimic the Tibetan plateau through the four seasons so that these mushrooms are not just producing their full spectrum of beneficial compounds, but at their highest concentrations. And essentially, you've brought the outdoors indoors for these mushrooms that you're growing within your facility. One batch is going to be essentially the same as the next time and time again, right? That's the idea. One of the hugest issues with botanical medicine in general, and this is no knock to any of my brothers and sisters in the world of natural medicine. But if you and I grew a field of echinacea flowers right now, we might find that 10% of them are super potent medicine and the other 90%, well, not so much. 
And that's going to change from year to year on the same piece of land, given the conditions in the soil, the rainfall, how much sunshine, all of those things. And so it's really difficult to standardize natural medicines today. And as a result, when they look at the clinical data, it's all over the place. Some natural medicines, echinacea studies show that it's super potent and a great antiviral. Some show that it had no effect at all. And it's because it's, again, difficult to standardize the potency of these types of products. So by bringing it into a control environment, we're both able to provide that consistency, but perhaps as importantly, we're preserving the values of nature. A lot of people ask me, oh, should I just be going out and harvesting these mushrooms? The truth is 96 to 99 percent of the original forest that stood in the United States is now gone. And there is not enough resource at this point for everybody to go out and wildcraft mushrooms or wildcraft medicinal herbs. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you very much to Eric Saracitas for taking the time for that interview. It really got me thinking about the amount of mushrooms that we are not aware of over here in this part of the world. Having traveled over in Asia and seen some of these stores that are literally overflowing with varieties of mushrooms that I just, you know, I, I didn't know, is this like a lichen? Is it a tree bark? Is it a plant? But no, they're all mushroom varieties and they're all edible. And there's just a heck of a lot of stuff that we're sort of missing out on only being aware of these couple of types that we see in our chopped salad over here. But yeah, the interesting thing about that one is with all the benefits that he cited with lion's mane mushroom, it's something that could just become part of our diet and sort of earn a place in our pantry rather than a place in our medicine cabinet. I have not yet tried lion's mane myself, but I do know an Asian food specialty store not too far from here, and I'm going to see if I can chase some down and do a little taste test. Before we completely leave the subject of mushrooms, I should also hint for the future, although we haven't gotten this interview lined up yet. We have gotten probably a dozen or more emails over the course of the year from people asking about a psychedelic mushroom episode. Which, which I'm extremely interested in doing, but I'm also worried about doing it on a Smart Drug Smarts podcast because obviously that's not a smart drug. I feel like we're going to need to have so many disclaimers and asterisks and don't try this at home, kids, that it might be one of the more interrupted episodes that we ever do. But nevertheless, I think that could be a hugely, hugely interesting and valuable episode for people. So we will look at putting that together. It's an interesting thing. There's so much research that's actually going on, finally, into psychedelics and what's actually going on within the brain during psychedelic experiences. But having spoken with a few people that are involved in this research, they're, they're really very, very cautious about wanting to go on the record with some of these things in any way that could be characterized as cheerleading or being overly positive because they don't want to get tarred with the brush of promoting drugs that can be used recreationally and therefore their grant funding shouldn't be granted and so on and so forth tricky political issue, but we are working on getting a psychedelic mushroom episode together sometime before the end of the year. So to be continued on that, but for right now, the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So I don't know about you, but I'm always a fan of a good, dirty trick, especially one that's done for a good reason. And not long ago, science journalist John Bohannon revealed a dirty trick that he'd pulled, an elaborate prank in which he had basically caught a giant swath of the publishing industry. He worked with some documentary filmmakers, Peter Onenkin and Deanna Lobel, and created basically a sham study with just enough credibility to it that they were able to get it published all over the place. They designed a study around something that they knew would be publishable and would have the veneer of scientific credibility while actually being completely bogus. And so, of course, they thought, OK, well, what's, what's media like to publish about? The answer, chocolate. And so when they pulled off this massive prank, things like the Daily Star had, has the world gone cocoa? Eating chocolate can help you lose weight. Cosmopolitan had a headline, chocolate leaves the pounds. And basically they had just enough data in their little tiny study to get major, major news coverage. Because of course, were that true, if chocolate really was a diet food, then that would be pretty big news. It's the kind of thing most people would love that to be true. But they designed their study really pretty clever. They took 15 people, so a very, very, very small sample size. They divided it into three groups one of which was a control, one of which was on a chocolate-intensive diet, and the other of which was a modified low-carb diet. So five people per group, and they followed them for a short time, had them eat this diet, and then looked at the results. And by sticking with such a small sample size and a small period that they were doing their study in, they knew they were going to come up with something interesting They did, and counterintuitive, something that would be newsworthy. They didn't know if it would be chocolate improves your blood pressure, chocolate loses weight, chocolate raises your IQ, but they had every reason to suspect that random probability with a sample size that small would deal them something that would be printable and interesting. And then they looked around and found a scientific journal that did not do any peer review on the studies that are submitted. They sent it in, and apparently within 24 hours, they got approved for publication. 
Once this was published in a journal, reporters in non-science media started taking it seriously, eating it up. Even though the institute that Bohannon claimed to work at existed only as a website, and it would have been really easy for journalists to look under the hood and find out that there wasn't really anything there, apparently nobody did it. And so shockingly easily, major, major media got hoodwinked and put out this completely sham finding to a world full of people, many of whom might be eating chocolate, thinking that they're going to lose weight by doing so. So great dirty trick, kind of a scary finding, but just goes to show a healthy skepticism, even when it's something that you see in print, is never a bad idea. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Okay, so that is the entire episode number 82 coming in for a landing. Thank you for hanging out until the end. If you liked what you heard, please spread the word about Smart Drug Smarts to your brain-owning friends. Check out what we're up to on smartdrugsmarts.com, where you'll see the links to everything that we talked about in this episode and in other episodes, and in things that aren't even episodes that are just published on the site and don't make it into the podcast. I will keep you mysteriously in the dark as to the subject of next week's subject matter, but know that I will be back at you next week, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only, although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not, and the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.